Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the panel Quantitative Hydrogeology. This is our first Making Groundwater Visible. This is the event for the Groundwater Project, our first event. And I'm, I'm your host, Everton de Oliveira. Thank you so much for joining us. Please upload your picture watching the event and tag it at the Groundwater to be featured on our social media pages. We count on you, like and share our posts. Volunteer to help translate books into your mother tongue. This is so important. Make a difference. Let's make the groundwater visible. And before we start, I would like to thank all our sponsors for making this event possible and free for all of you. TDS, Technical Development Solutions from Saudi Arabia. Hydroplan, a consulting company from Brazil. G360 from the University of Guelph in Canada. Solinst Equipments from Canada. And Waterloo Barrier also from Canada. Hydroplan from Brazil, a consulting company. G360 from the University of Guelph and Waterloo Barrier and also to all the individual donors. Without them, this noble endeavor would not be possible. Please join them, donate if you are an individual or add the name of your company as a sponsor to a game changer initiative. Okay, lead by example is a very used up expression, but here today it fully applies to our main speaker. Professor Guillain de Marcilly, Professor Emeritus at the University Pierre et Marie Curie in France. He has an impressive career spanning from groundwater to food production, yes, passing through so many topics with such competence that he could easily give us that guilty feeling of being too lazy. On top of it, he is very friendly and generous with his students and colleagues in particular, and with everyone in general. He produced books in French and English, and are an early supporter of our groundwater project. We thank him for that. We'd like him to lend us his prestige to help spread hydro the hydrogeology knowledge even further. To make company to Professor de Massy, we have three of his former students and colleagues that have, been, that have an impressive career of their own to talk about their careers and the push that they received from Guillain de Marseille. They are Dr. Craig Simmons, a Metal Flinders Distinguished Professor of Hydrogeology in Australia. Dr. Hayat Chihi, Professor of Geostatistics and Geomodeling at the Center for Water Research and Technologies in Tunisia. Dr. Maria Schaffmeister, professor of the, uh, at the Institute of Geography and Geology at the University of Grace, Greifswald. Oh, Jesus, my, my German is so poor. Sorry for that. Greifswald in Germany. I hope I, I got it right this time. So I would like to thank all of them for their willingness to participate especially Professor de Marcilly from his dedication and Professor Hyatt, who most kindly helped me put this session together. Thank you very much. And please, now I'd like you to make a brief introduction about yourselves. Professor Guillain, you start a few lines about yourself, if that was necessary. I know it's unnecessary, but let's be formal. Make an introduction about yourself, please. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for organizing this session. What can I say about myself? Uh, I think my initial degree was mining engineer. So I'm basically an engineer and that will be translated in the writing of the book, which we will discuss in a moment. I wanted to study geology at the Paris School of Mines, but I was pre prevented to do that because as many of you know, I have problems with my legs, I cannot walk very well. And the professor of geology, whose name was Jean Gogel, he was an excellent professor, said, 
I don't want you in my class because you cannot walk and a geologist must know how to walk. So get out of my office and do something else, not geology. So that was a sort of a disappointment for me. And I studied fluid mechanics instead of geology, but I took courses of geology later on in my career. Oh, thank you. We're so glad you stayed on. That's, that's so good for us. Thank you very much. Please, Hayat, you're next. Uh, I'm uh, Hayat Shihi from uh, Tunisia. I'm a professor at the Center for Water Research and Technologies. I am a teacher also at a uh, uh, few universities in uh, Tunisia. I'm teaching uh, geostatistics uh, mostly uh, and uh, geomodeling. Um, I have uh, some uh, projects that I am uh, leading with my students, my colleagues uh, from Tunisia and uh, from international university also. Uh, I've been uh, a PhD student, a fortunate uh, PhD student uh, of Guilain de Marsili, and uh, uh, he still uh, helped us, uh, me and uh, my students, uh, and I am grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, are all, we all are great, grateful for that. Um, and Maria, please. Yeah, my name is Maria Theresia Schaffmeister. I'm professor for applied geology and uh, hydrogeology at Greifswald University. Uh, actually, Guilain, is somewhat similar to your career, not so good, but <laughs> <laughs> um, also I wanted to, I wanted to become a paleontologist. That was my goal and I didn't achieve this because hydrogeology came into my way and it was because of quantification hydrogeology that I wanted to do that, only the professor didn't want me. So I had to make a little detour going by mathematical geology. <laughs> That's my brief life. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, your turn, Craig, please. Yeah, thanks Everton, and it's a, a real pleasure to be here. I'm really honoured to participate. So, um, look, my background actually started out in electrical and electronic engineering. So people often say water and electricity do not mix. Um, and I had a slightly sort of contorted and detoured um, background as well. So I did engineering followed by physics uh, and then had the fortune of doing a PhD in hydrogeology at CSIRO. Uh, in the 1990s where I got into groundwater modelling. I'm now a professor of hydrogeology at Flinders University here in Australia um, and also the foundation director of the National Centre for Groundwater Research and Training in Australia. Thank you very much. Thanks for all of you uh, for participating in that. It's, it's a great pleasure and an honour having, having all of you here today. Now please, uh, Gilan, could you make your presentation please? It's not really a presentation, it's a, a little bit of the story of how I came to write this book, Quantitative Hydrogeology, which is chopped up there in my shelf. Um, the story is that I was doing research in groundwater hydrology at the Paris School of Mines in Fontainebleau. And uh, with three months notice, advance notice, I was told that I should start teaching groundwater hydrology to the Ecole des Mines students next fall. So I had three months to prepare a course. I had no experience in teaching. Therefore, I said, what, what can I do to be ready in three months to teach a course which was going to be 30 classes? So it's long. So I started to read old books in French, in English, in German, in anything. And um, it's very presumptuous to me to say that, but. I didn't find in any of the books I read what I wanted to teach. I wanted to teach groundwater hydrology starting from basics. You, you know, for instance, in fluid mechanics, uh, any problem of fluid mechanics is to quantify seven magnitudes, which are the pressure, the mass per unit volume, the viscosity, the three components, components of, the, of, of the velocity vector, and uh, I forgot one, viscosity and uh, temperature, of course. 
So in order to solve any groundwater or flow problem, you need to write seven equations which uh, enable you to, to calculate these seven magnitude. So, you know, I thought it was interesting to start the book by coupling it with fluid mechanics in general and understand that hydrogeology is the use of fluid mechanics in a particular medium, which is very com complex and which needs to be de described in detail. So that was the start of, of the book. And uh, I think the books I had read prior to doing my, my course, we're doing that in a way or another, but not systematically, you know. I want to have systematic, you start from physics, which you know, mechanics, when you know, and then you build up the equations that you use to, to solve the groundwater problem. So the second things I wanted to, to do is to put the context of hydrogeology, not in a fluid mechanics, framework, but in a geological framework, because we are talking about geological layers, we are talking about variability of the properties of these layers, and all that needs to be taken into account from the start. So I want to combine these two things, fluid mechanics on the one hand, and geology, heterogeneity, natural system, and so on. So that's what I tried to do. So I was not able to complete my course before the start of the course. So I was a little bit worried because I had to teach. And so what I did is that every night before the class started, I had to work until past midnight to be sure that I would prepare the material I needed. So in order to have the students follow me, I decided I would like to have a sort of a handwritten textbook that I would distribute to them so that they can look back at the notes, at my notes, and use that for, for the learning, for the reading of the class. So the book started that way. It, it was, I would say, semi-finished in, I think started in 73. Uh, after the first class, the first year of 30 classes, I had something which, you know, was not perfect, but at least had the material in. And so I modified and improved and uh, polished those chapters in, uh, in the following classes. And in, uh, I was approached by a French editor, which you know, because you've seen the French version of my book, which is Masson. And they said, well, your notes are interesting. Why don't you make a book out of it? So I did that and I wrote in French. It was short, it was much shorter than the English version. And that was published and, uh, in 81 in 1500 copies. And the book was never reprinted because it sold rather fast, and, but Masson was not interested in that. And it, uh, it was abandoned, I would say. But then I had the luck to, was to meet a colleague, the Canadian colleague, whose name is Dick Jackson, Dr. Dick Jackson, who is in fact American, but he moved to the US, he lived in Canada, and then he came back to work for the uh, US company called Intera in Austin, Texas. And he was doing consulting and he was an excellent hydrogeologist. So he could read French and of course he spoke English. And he found my book, on some, I don't know how, in a library or in a, in a bookshelf. And he came to me and he said, you know, this is very interesting what you've written. And the same book does not exist in English. So I encourage you to translate that book and put it into English. And also what he said, I didn't have that in mind, is that, well, French, in France, one technique which is being developed is geostatistics, which of course applies very well to hydrogeology. And there's nothing written today in hydrogeology and geostat. So why don't you add a chapter on geostatistics applied to hydrology, which is what I did. What I did. So the book, evolved by this suggestion of Dick Jackson, who is a good friend and he's still a good friend. Uh, and uh, I had some difficulties convincing uh, US publishers to publish that book because they found or they thought that the book was too, too complex and would not feed the needs of, of average American students. 
which he, he it, it turned out that it was wrong because I think the American students who took who used that book for textbook in in master degrees surely really I think they I hope at least they liked it so this, this is certainly the way the book was uh, completed it's because of the pressure added by Dick Jackson which I thank for what he did it's a very good story it's a very good Quite interesting, quite interesting. So, and, and uh, it, was it the book translated to, to another language or is English and French? No, I, I forgot to say that the translator for my book to French, from French to English was done by my wife. My wife is a professional translator and we worked together and she, she did the English writing. And I'm not a judge because I speak French in principle or mainly French, and my English is, well, shaggy. So, uh, but I think what she did is good. So I'm, I'm glad that she helped me to do that. No, I, I'm not a great judge because I speak Portuguese, but yeah, for me, your English is very good. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Though. Well, 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 we'll dig into your informations a little later. Just let's, let's listen to the others and then we'll go back to you. Just a moment. Milan, thank you very much for now. You're uh, uh, let's go. Hayat, you're next. Yes, uh, we can share the screen, please. You, 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 can, you, you have to share, please. You have okay. to share from your computer. Uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, present the, uh, the, 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 the classical book of uh, the classic book of uh, Guilain de Marseille entitled uh, Quantitative Hydrogeology. Uh, groundwater uh, hydrology for engineers. So, uh, quantitative hydrogeology, groundwater hydrology for uh, engineers is a revised and uh, expanded version of the original uh, uh, French edition entitled Hydrogeology, Quanti Hydrogeology Quantitative, published in, by Masson in uh, 1981. Then it was translated to uh, English uh, by uh, Gulina de Marcelli and published in, uh, uh, by um, Academic Press in 1986. So the book uh, concerns, uh, uh, mostly of, uh, concerns mostly quantitative groundwater evaluation and uh, uh, contaminant uh, transport uh, modeling. Although it was written at the early career of uh, Gulina de Marcelli, uh, this book still holds up and it constitutes a relevant reference on groundwater issues for students, engineers, hydrogeologists, geologists, and uh, research in general. Why? Because all practitioners and uh, scientists will find their requirement from classical mathematical expressions uh, and hydro uh, par uh, parameterization of hydrogeological uh, uh, parameters uh, to flow equations. More importantly, uh, although the, the Marcilli uses a substantial and extensive uh, amount of mathematical equations, he never missed to explain in uh, uh, detail the basics of the issue of the geological phenomena and uh, the physical principles to define uh, the fluid equations in force and fractured media. All this is uh, well illustrated and in detail by diagrams and figures. In particular, all is expressed uh, in uh, easily readable scientific English. For the content, the book is uh, subdivided into four parts. Uh, the first part deals with the, the concept of water uh, resources. Uh, where D Guilain de Marcilly described globally the hydrogeologic uh, cycle uh, with an emphasis on uh, groundwater. Uh, the second uh, part, which is the most important in the book, uh, Guilain de Marcilly addressed uh, progressively the quantitative hydrogeology from estimation of the hydraulic parameters to the elaboration of various type of uh, fluid uh, flow. Uh, and this uh, by adapting, by applying principles of fluid mechanics, uh, making the practitioner uh, aware of uh, the importance of uh, uh, considering and integrating uh, 
heterogeneity in sports media and uh, in aquifers. Um, but this is done in a manner uh, as uh, if he is uh, uh, teaching uh, the reader uh, how uh, to face with uh, problems like uh, drainage and compaction, uh, flow and the transport uh, process, uh, uh, all this in complex heterogeneous aquifers. Uh, specifically, uh, the Marcelli in this chapter describes the physical process uh, occurring in pores, uh, in pores and the fractured uh, uh, rocks. Uh, also, he developed the, the flow and the transport equations uh, in both steady and transient uh, states. Uh, and the outline, he outlined the methods for solving uh, these basic equations. And uh, finally, he presented uh, practical methods to measure the physical uh, parameters and the properties of any aquifer type. All the assumptions and equations required for applying these uh, formulas and these uh, equations are comprehensively uh, described and uh, in uh, simple terms. In the third part, uh, Guillain de Marcilly offered joining ideas on hydrogeological issues. Uh, dealing with transport phenomena, pollution issues, and uh, geothermal problems. Uh, he describes in detail uh, aquifer pollution by miscible fluids and the uh, multi-phase uh, flow of immiscible fluids. In the fourth part, Guillain de Marcilly uh, added two motivating chapters, especially for students and uh, scientific beginners. Uh, the first chapter deals with uh, geostatistics, and this is presented uh, uh, in a relatively uh, and uh, but uh, uh, thoroughly uh, in, in a thoroughly presentation to express uh, uh, the special variability and correlation uh, of the hydrogeological parameters. Uh, I would like to say something about geostatistics because I was in uh, the center of the uh, uh, geostatistic, and I know very well uh, Georges Matheron, but he was the major in mining geostatistics. Uh, Guillain de Marcelli uh, is the pioneer in introducing geostatistics in hydrogeological uh, issues and uh, uh, prob uh, problems. Uh, principally, he introduced the stochastic theory in the equation and in the estimation of the hydrogeological uh, parameters. Uh, also, he was uh, the first to introduce uh, geostatistics in uh, uh, many countries in the world. Uh, and uh, at the beginning, it was in the USA. Uh, the second chapter in this fourth part, uh, 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 Guillain de Marcilly outlined in a simple uh, way the principle of uh, uh, numerical equations to solve the flow equation such as uh, the finite differences, the element differences, and the solving transport equations. All this is illustrated by uh, many uh, simple examples uh, so that any student or uh, student or practitioner uh, concerned with uh, hydrodynamic uh, modeling could be familiar with easily. Uh, presenting uh, this book in this manner, I could say that the book provides uh, uh, a comprehensive uh, and progressive holding of the theory, the practice in hydrogeological modeling. Uh, specific attention was and is uh, still addressed by Guillain de Marcilly in introducing heterogeneity and uh, uh, complex uh, geology in uh, hydrogeological modeling. For this, Guillain de Marcilly proposed to combine the stochastic uh, hydro, uh, concepts and uh, the special variability of uh, hydrogeological parameters and variables as a basis to explain his uh, intuitive, uh, intuitive understanding of uh, water flow in heterogeneous aquifer. Uh, I think that this is a philosophy which constituted a foundation of many advanced methods and research in hydrogeology uh, that have been continuously de developed uh, until this day. And this, I think, will be uh, more developed by my uh, colleague, uh, uh, Maria. 
thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you very much, Haya. You started a bit shaky, but then you move along quite well. Thank you, congratulations. <laughs> I thought that was the English, right? But that's, that was perfect. Thank you very much. So, uh, Maria, your turn, please. Yeah, also I'd like to give a little presentation. I hope it works. Can you see something? Yes, perfect. Okay. So uh, we've now learned so much again about Guillain's book, uh, which we all knew. Uh, so I try to give a more general uh, aspect of uh, quantitative hydrogeology. And you see that I put a question mark here. Um, first, still, as I told you before, what my way to quantitative hydrogeology was, as I said, I wanted to become a paleontologist and it turned out this is exactly not what I'm trying to do. So describing things qualitatively. I, I learned very soon that I love to work with numbers and, and to quantify things. Not as many geologists might do, go to the field and say, well, we have a rock which is red and probably very, very old. So this is, this is, this is too, too uh, well, qualitative for me. So uh, as I said, I, I, then I wanted to become a hydrogeologist. The professor didn't like me, so I could not do hydrogeology. But then I turned, uh, I did a detour, and I came to mathematical geology. And you see here the emblem of uh, IMG, the International Association of Mathematical Geology. I put this here because it shows a little bit of my history too, because I started at the beginning of the 80s to work with computers as a geologist. Geologists usually didn't like equations in computers. They like their hammer, which you can see here. And so um, this was my big advantage that I started to work with computers with punch cards and everything and, and programming in Fortran to those who still know this name, <laughs> Fortran, this language. So, and I did this detour and I, I learned something about geostatistics. My, my thesis was on Krieging and uh, trend surface analysis. But then I made my way to hydrogeology. I started uh, to learn uh, groundwater modeling and my PhD thesis was on, on generating stochastic uh, fields of, of hydraulic conductivity and other parameters to be used in numerical models. And this was my way here. And it was exactly this time in 1988 that I first met Guillain in person. And I was so amazed because I knew him, of course, from his books and his uh, publications. And I thought to see this man, it was great, great thing for me. Then I did my habilitation. You know, in Germany, we have the second uh, uh, PhD thesis. And I mentioned this because uh, Guillain was so nice to serve as referee of my habilitation, which was written in German. So thank you for this again. <laughs> OK, this was a little bit my way to come to quantitative hydrogeology. But now I'd like to put a, a more provocative question, because does quantitative hydrogeology exist? Because if it exists, this implies that we also have qualitative hydrogeology. And actually, I don't know what that should be, qualitative hydrogeology. We all know that it was those French engineers, Darcy and Dupuis, who first uh, founded quantitative hydrogeology before they even know what hydrogeology was, because the first definition of hydrogeology as we use it today was done 20 years later. So my facet is there is no hydrogeology without quantification. So hydrogeology is quantitative hydrogeology. And I think this is something that Guillain has recognized and has written this wonderful book about it. The question is, how do we honor and how do we live quantitative hydrogeology today? And being a professor at university, of course, I think of train, how, how do we train quantitative hydrogeology in university courses or do we do this for advanced training courses for professionals? 
is there quantitative hydrogeology in professional practice? And of course, what about research and publication? So what I could do within those very few days that I knew that I could participate tonight, uh, or today, as you like, um, I did some brief uh, review and I looked at German university courses and uh, there are no courses on quantitative hydrogeology, not at least in Germany, except one university offers quantitative hydrogeology and I was excited to learn what is the curriculum. And to tell you what it was, the curriculum of quantitative hydrogeology is geochemistry and um, um, tracer uh, hydrology and uh, legal aspects of groundwater. That is a curriculum of quantitative hydrogeology. And I don't think that this has too much overlapping with what uh, uh, Guillain wrote in his book. So, so there is no real courses on hydrogeology, uh, on quantitative hydrogeology, because it is always incorporated in hydrogeology. And also we now have courses, uh, other computational courses where we do learn about mathematical methods in geology and in hydrogeology. However, I think still in Germany, there are many professionals, uh, hydrogeological professionals who feel a big gap between what they learned during their geology study and what they need now. And so there is a high demand to, to learn more about quantitative methods in hydrogeology and I can give a number for this. The German Hydrogeological Society offers advanced training courses and about 80% of those courses deal with quantitative hydrogeological methods uh, in a broader sense. So modeling, statistics, geostatistics, GIS, pump test analysis, regionalization, whatever you may think of. So there is a high demand still uh, among professionals to learn this. Well, research and publications here, I'm brief because I know that Craig will mention this in more detail. But what I did is serving as an editor of Hydrogeology Journal, I just did again an unrepresentative statistic on the latest uh, uh, online publications of Hydrogeology Journal. So since uh, the beginning of this year, there were 18 papers published and I did a brief glance at those publications and out of those 18 publications, 12 publications were really dealing with uh, quantitative methods or even doing research on quantitative methods. You don't need to read this right now, but it's just to illustrate 12 out of 18, that makes uh, two thirds. So I think uh, this is again a proof that hydrogeology, uh, quantitative hydrogeology still lives. Well, and then the question is, did it change since 1986 when quantitative hydrogeology was published in English? Uh, here I have a very balanced answer. My answer is yes and no, because no, Quantitative hydrogeology did not change because the challenge to develop suitable mathematical concepts and tools which describe any groundwater rock related processes from a quantitative aspect, this challenge is still apparent. So nothing new about this. But yes, since 1986, the computing technology has exploded and it has made its way to hydrogeologists' professional life. And so this inspires hydrogeologists and mathematicians, engineers, informaticians to cooperate and to further develop convenient quantitative tools in hydrogeology. And I, we all have to thank Guillain for this, that he did some sort of uh, uh, ignition of this process. So thank you everybody and merci Guillain. And I think you know this picture. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation. Thank you for your effort and for your time. Uh, please, Craig, your turn now.
Thank you, everyone. And I'm delighted to speak about quantitative hydrogeology and a tiny bit about my own contribution uh, to this field. So as I said earlier, I'm an engineer and physicist by training, uh, and I grew up at CSIRO in Australia in the 1990s doing a PhD in hydrogeology. And I was studying groundwater dynamics, variable density flow processes beneath saline disposal basins and salt lakes, running computer models of laboratory experiments that were made using Healy Shore cells. Now at that time, the computer models would take days to run on the very fastest computers. Uh, and the laboratory experiments took just six hours. And I went on to work in groundwater hydrology uh, and groundwater modeling. And I had the good fortune of building and running the National Centre for Groundwater Research and Training, NCGRT, in Australia. I thought I'd start with some very basic points about groundwater just to set the scene. We know that groundwater supplies half of the world's drinking water and about 43% of the water used to grow food. Uh, groundwater depletion and pollution are huge international issues. Groundwater is front in major contemporary pressing issues, whether we're dealing with water security, scarcity and supply, coal seam gas, shale gas and fracking, food production, mining and energy, nuclear and radioactive waste disposal, groundwater contamination, to name just a few. Now, as groundwater hydrologists, we study the occurrence, distribution, movement and quality of groundwater. Uh, quantitative hydrogeology is a key part of understanding, conceptualizing and predicting groundwater behavior. We ask quantitative questions that demand quantitative answers. How much water can we sustainably extract from an aquifer? How fast and in what direction is a contaminant plume moving through the underground geologic maze? Will contamination get into our drinking water supply? How quickly? By when? At what concentration? And how much groundwater is discharging to the rivers? Our first digital groundwater models were developed in the 1950s. Room-sized electrical analogues for groundwater flow modeling were still in vogue. And I thought it was very interesting that in 1969, one of our pioneering groundwater giants, Alan Fries, author of the groundwater Bible, Fries and Cherry, had a dream. Fries imagined a virtual hydrologic laboratory where all hydrologic processes, rainfall, evaporation, runoff, recharge to groundwater could be modeled together and at large scales. The problem could not be run on the computers of the day. Within just a couple of decades, groundwater scientists began to make Fries's dream a reality. The development of integrated surface subsurface hydrologic models took off in the 1990s. In 2010, Collette and co-authors used 16,384 processes with nearly 10 billion grid cells to solve what was essentially the freeze problem. Quite amazing. Their extraordinary study demonstrated that regional scale hydrologic simulations on the order of a thousand square kilometers are feasible at fine hydrologic resolution, about one to 10 meters laterally, sorry, and one centimeter to 10 centimeters vertically within reasonable computational times. Now we don't stop at running one model. We run models thousands of times. And we do this to quantify and inevitably reduce uncertainty in our conceptual models, in model parameters, and in model predictions. And we do this to understand data worth, what type of data to collect in the field, and at what spatial and temporal resolution to best inform our predictions. Put simply, how do we get the best bang for buck? These ideas are inspired by Italian economist Vilfredo Perito's pioneering work. Parameter estimation, uncertainty analysis, and data worth studies underpin smart, efficient, and effective collect data collection strategies. And they underpin risk-based environmental decision-making. They involve massive amounts of model-generated data. Now, in days past, and is often the case today, we're lucky if we have one or two boreholes in a watershed. Field data is expensive. Each bore is roughly $100,000. Acquiring urgently needed and grossly lacking fundamental data 
at appropriate spatial and temporal scales to support analyses that are relevant to the critical questions that we are asking in hydrogeology is a challenge and an opportunity. But more and more data are becoming available for use in groundwater modelling. New and extraordinary data sets have been collected. Satellites now exist. For example, the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment follow on Gracebow, tracking underground water storage and rich GIS data sets for vegetation and soil types that have millions of data points in a layer. Big data is increasingly publicly available and provides exciting opportunities, solutions and ideas that are simply waiting to be found. Addressing the continuing and pressing need to develop mature and robust groundwater models to predict groundwater processes that are underpinned by strong geologic and hydrogeologic conceptual models and comprehensive data remains a challenge. Now, quantitative hydrogeology is not just about data or just about modeling. It is necessarily about both. The nature, spatial and temporal resolution of the data we require will depend on the specific questions that we are asking, their representative spatial and temporal scale, and the intrinsic physics. Data assimilation is a growing challenge and opportunity for groundwater science. Different data types, for example, environmental traces that Maria mentioned just a moment ago, can help reduce model non-uniqueness. Now, quantitative hydrogeology will clearly need more than an abacus, and it will need to pay attention to the often problematic, what I call theory to measurement ratio in groundwater analyses, finding the sweet spot, the appropriate level of simplicity, complexity for modeling and requisite data to answer a specific question at appropriate scales remains a challenge. Occam's razor and Einstein's advice that Everything should be made as simple as possible, but never simpler are guiding philosophies. They must be implemented, quantified, and assessed mathematically. And crucially, there are always unknown compl complicating factors which cause the actual behavior of a groundwater system to deviate from prediction or expectation. And this includes conceptual model surprise, as John Breederhoff puts it. Surprise being, I quote, new data that renders the prevailing conceptual model invalid. And based on empirical data, Breederhoff 2005 estimated that surprise occurs in some 20 to 30% of model analyses. Geologic heterogeneity may be one root cause for, su for surprise. Dealing with geologic heterogeneity continues to pose a major challenge in understanding how groundwater systems behave. Our underground labyrinth or maze has properties that vary by over 12 orders of magnitude. Now the difference between walking and the speed of light is eight orders of magnitude. And someone once said to me, we put man on the moon in 1969 and hydrogeologists are still saying that they cannot predict the fate of a contaminant plume. Now, after scratching my head for a little while, um, I responded that if the pathway between the earth and the moon was anywhere near as complex and as heterogeneous as that which we encounter in aquifers, that we would not have got to the moon either. Putting geology back into hydrogeology remains a challenge, but we will never know where every fracture or every fault is, nor every detail of heterogeneity at every scale. Understanding the crucial features of our conceptual model is key. What is material and when does it matter? Is our analysis fit for purpose? In their article, Dealing with Spatial Heterogeneity in Hydrogeology's Special Theme Issue, The Future of Hydrogeology, De Marcelli et al. 2005 make the point, and I quote, until the large scale permeability of an aquifer can be reconstructed from small scale measurements, there will be a credibility problem for our discipline. Gilard de Marcelli, following George Matheron's seminal contribution, made some fundamental developments in geostatistics. Both with Jean-Pierre Delhomme were highly influential in bringing geostatistics to the groundwater world, exemplified in de Marcelli's seminal textbook, book, Quantitative Hydrogeology, 
itself an important tool in the study of heterogeneity. So we must use every tool in our hydrogeologist's toolbox. As American psychologist Abraham Maslow said, and I quote, if you only have a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. And there are many examples of new advances in parameter estimation methods, uncertainty analysis, geostatistics, optimization, environmental traces for characterizing groundwater and linking geologic information with hydrogeologic models that have not found their way into everyday practice. And this builds on and touches on a point that Maria made a little while ago. So as we look to the future, linking and integrating groundwater with soils, surface water, ecosystems and climate science are exciting challenges. And there will be others that are currently unknown. Contemporary groundwater problems have moved well beyond classical hydrogeology, concerned as it was with how much water was stored in or could be extracted from an aquifer. Quantitative hydrogeology, including 21st century groundwater modeling, uncertainty analyses, and the manipulation, processing, analysis, and storage of gargantuan amounts of field-based and model data will be necessary to advance and solve many of these problems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Craig. Thank you all for a nice presentation. I would like to start our, our session here, asking one personal question to Guilain. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, quite uh, impressive, impressively for me that uh, a professor turned you out from his geology course because, you know, uh, an amazing reason, right? And, and even, even though you, you, you became an, a very good hydrogeologist, regardless of that, you know, silly decision, I would say. Well, that for me strikes in a position because you wrote your book, uh, you, you were not that old. You were young when you wrote the quantitative hydro, hydrogeology. What makes someone become so confident to write a book when you're young and put it to people? And did you have any idea it, uh, about the, what the book would, would become? Because you wrote other books in other subjects. Where does the, 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 the confidence come from, please? It's a tough question. Um, I was about 40 when I published the first version of the book in French. And as I said, my motivation was give something to the students I was going to teach. So I wanted them to have written material that they could look at if they didn't understand what I said orally in class. So my real motivation is to help students understand and learn and uh, integrate what, what the course was. First of all, when I wrote this book, many colleagues came to me and said, you're stupid, why would you waste your time writing a book? You should write articles. Articles are much more important for your career than books and forget about the book and uh, go on and write good articles in good journals. And that was not my philosophy. I didn't want to work. I did publish papers, of course, as everybody do, does. But my main motivation was to teach and help students. So this is why I wrote that book. And I think that if this book has some success, uh, it's due to that. I'd just like to show you this new book, which has been written by a Belgian colleague, whose name is um, Alain Dassargue. Uh, Alain Dassargue written this book Applied Hydrogeology, which was just published this year and the year before, both in French and English. Put it high, yeah. That's Thank okay, you. Yeah. And I think it's many of the chapters of that book are based on my old quantitative hydrogeology. But I'm very proud that you know a new book written by somebody else and improved and with new topics and new so on was, was published recently, continuing. Uh, the, the work I started with uh, writing books. Uh, if I may, I'd like to add 
one idea which may be crazy, but which came to my mind when, when listening to the other speakers. You're all familiar with that in other disciplines like, for instance, uh, meteorology, atmosphere, climate, and so on, they are slowly turning away from modeling in the usual sense of solving flow equations and using what's called artificial intelligence. In other words, they collect data because it's easier to collect data on weather and clouds and sun and temperatures and wind velocity. You can have huge databases. And what they say is that if you have these huge database, these databases, and you have a situation here today, if you look at what happened maybe hundred or no, tens of years before, and you find the same situation, then you can predict what's going to happen here today based on what happened 10, 20 years ago for a similar situation. This is called artificial intelligence, is to accumulate many data on the past and then use that very rapidly to extrapolate to the future. Now, there's no clear evidence that this can be used for groundwater. But still, you have so many differences and similarities between various aquifers in different places. So then one, one should look at, is it possible to extrapolate you know, the behavior of an aquifer based on another aquifer somewhere else? I'm thinking about South America. You have on the east, on the west coast of South America, you have a long, 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 long line, and you have the high mountains, and you have rivers transporting sediments towards the, 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 the sea. Each of these little rivers create a small aquifer, so alluvial aquifer. And these aquifers, I mean, it, we have hundreds of small aquifers generated by the same phenomenon, mountain erosion sedimentation. And there's certainly some possibility to use intelligent, artificial intelligence to correlate what we see in one aquifer with what happens in others. So this is not modeling, but I think there is some benefits, benefit to make as trying to see if one can use artificial intelligence to improve our understanding of what happens today with hydrogeology. It's just an idea, it needs to be worked out. Is it, is, uh, are you cooking another book on that or not? <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm too old to write anything. You're good, you're good at that, you're good at that. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I, what I like to do is perhaps help, help others, help students, help your younger faculty to, to, to develop and write what they want, but I'm, I'm no longer going to write a book. I was asked by the publisher of Quantitative Hydrogeology, Academic Press, to revise the book, to make a new version. I realized that I couldn't do it that on my own. I mean, it's too much new things happened since in the last 40 years. So I needed to have help from former students. So I approached quite a number of them and say, hey, would you be interested in revising my book and uh, adding to some new chapters and correcting the errors in the first version and so on? And all said, yes, yes, yes. But in fact, they do nothing. Because you know, you have better things to do than rewriting old books. So you should start new things fresh and go on with uh, new ideas and new concepts and new authors. Well, you, you, you are, um, that's, that's basically the, the, the idea on how the groundwater project uh, arise because it was a revision. The idea was to review the, the Freeze and Cherry book, but then John says, well, What's the point? We, we need to rewrite new chapters and things grew so fast. But I, I have one question for, for, for everybody because we, you have three uh, colleagues that are here, uh, of course, because of you. And of course, because of Hyatt, they, she invited uh, Maria and Craig. Uh, the question is for the four of you. First is, uh, Gila, what uh, the feeling, because you know, you, you're one of the, the finest and well known hydrogeologists uh, on earth, basically, right? You, yes, yes. Well, what can you say? Don't, don't be modest. 
that's true. Uh, it is easy to see because you have influenced people in Brazil. I studied it with your book. You have Hyatt from Tunisia. You have Maria from Germany and you have Craig in Australia. So it's, it is true, okay? So uh, for me, the question is, uh, what, is uh, what is the feeling of, of that? And for you guys, how did you, how did you get to, to know him and what's the impression of working with, with Guilherme? You can go first, Guilherme. Oh, <laughs> you know, if we, I think of going back to writing a book, I think it's really a personal work. I wouldn't very much like to share the writing of a book with any, even the best friend I have. I wouldn't like that because, you know, it's something personal. You, you put your, your own spirit on, on writing a book. So what Freeze and Cherry did was very good because Cherry was bringing the chemistry yeah. and Freeze was bringing the physics and the geology. So this is a good, good way of coupling things. But um, when you talk about one topic like quantitative hydrogeology, you can perhaps divide that into a few chapters with different authors. But in fact, I think writing a book is something which is very personal and you have to have motivation to do that. And it's difficult to do that as a, as a large group, I think so. Yes, it is. It is. I, I agree. I agree. Well, but uh, but but the people, uh, as you mentioned, uh, it's they're, they're they're producing books independently. They're producing independently, so that's how it goes. Yes. yes. No. No. It wouldn't be easy. I agree with you. You guys, how 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 did Gila influence your lives, and how did you get to know him and work with him? How is it working with Gila? Hi, you go first. You're. Uh, I think that uh, Guilherme de Marcelli is uh, uh, a very humble, generous man. When he's uh, speaking with you, he speaks with you as a, a very competent person in that uh, uh, discipline or in that uh, uh, science. So uh, uh, he, he started knowing you, how to, you are working. Uh, your personality, and then he invites you to uh, uh, to study at uh, your manner. I um, remember when I was uh, uh, a PhD student of Guillain de Marcelli, the first question was, uh, uh, have you a home? Uh, before uh, starting uh, doing your thesis, uh, and uh, have you enough money? Uh, uh, at uh, this time, uh, I have a, a, an internship from uh, Tunisia, but he added me uh, another one from uh, CNRS. Uh, the second thing, um, uh, he invite any person who could help you. Uh, for example, he invited uh, Michel Tesson to help me in uh, 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 stratigraph uh, sequential uh, stratigraphy. Uh, he invited uh, Alain Galli to uh, help uh, me in uh, non-stationary geostatistics. And uh, he continuously, uh, he's continuously helping me to, uh, uh, for example, uh, the, 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 uh, the major difficulty in Tunisia and uh, everywhere for uh, um, modeling uh, aquifers is uh, uh, the data scarcity. Uh, and uh, uh, how to do this uh, uh, by, um, by cooperating with uh, other international uh, uh, institutions uh, uh, who are uh, working on uh, uh, softwares uh, like uh, GeoVariance, for example. And uh, this, uh, his manner of working influenced me uh, a lot. Even with my students, I'm doing exactly the same thing. They are my, uh, my sons and my, uh, my brothers. My, uh, they are my family and not uh, stranger persons. That's very good. That's very nice. Very sweet. Thank you. Maria, please, your experience. I can completely confirm what uh, Hayat says. Uh, 
but maybe I can also add something. Uh, Gila was always very inspiring. So when you discuss with him, you, you uh, soon get new ideas you never thought of. So as we ha just had an example a few moments ago. Yes. And, and I always learned to know something new. And of course, he's very generous. And um, um, what I liked, I, I, I did just one course with you, Gila, on geostatistics and hydrogeology. And at that point, I already thought that I had understood the principles of geostatistics, but that wasn't true. But then you gave some examples, and as a geologist, not too familiar with equations, uh, so you always put some illustrations. I remember how you uh, tried to explain to us the, the uh, geostatistical basic assumptions by comparing this with those uh, dunes in Tunisia. You remember this? So which all have the same shape, and so they are all analogs of one uh, variable. So this I liked very much and uh, well, this uh, was extremely inspiring. And one thing maybe <laughs> I'd like to say, I, I have learned something from you and this is, uh, it fits into these times today. Um, since I know you, I drink Corona beer. You might, re <laughs> you might remember that uh, we once traveled together and, and we uh, uh, had some beer and, and this Corona beer doesn't make this foam, which we Germans like, and, and uh, you, uh, I was complaining about this. But since then, I only drink Corona beer, no German beer anymore. So this is something I have from you. <laughs> Not the only thing. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, that's very nice. Craig, please. Uh, thanks, Everton. Um, I uh, first met Gilan, it was in 2006, and it was at the um, Groundwater IAH conference in Dijon in France. It was the 150th anniversary conference of Darcy's Law, and uh, I think that the way in which this came about speaks a lot about Gilan and the way he thinks. And I was in my early 30s at the time and had an interest in Darcy and had written um, a little editorial for hydrogeology about Darcy and, and so forth. And Gilan had uh, invited me to give the opening plenary address uh, for this conference. So taking a chance on an Australian kid um, to do this, I think was, uh, was a little bit about how Gilan thinks, but thank you. Gilan. And uh, so we've uh, worked together. Um, Gilan was involved in chairing our international board for my centre and um, really inspiring me, but many other students, both in our centre, but also around the world. And I know um, personally that Gilan has been a mentor uh, and an advisor uh, and a friend and really a philosopher guide that um, has really um, helped and shaped so many aspects of uh, my career. And so I agree with everything that's been said. I find Gilan to be extremely generous and selfless and highly dedicated to the people that he works with and, um, and to his students. And I know that all of the, the students that I've spoken to that have worked with Gilan and his colleagues Feel the, feel the same. And I've heard them recount, I don't know if this is true, Gilan, of late nights in the laboratory where they would be working and you would be coming into the lab nearly at midnight and, and so forth. So uh, you clearly had the passion and the energy and the commitment um, throughout your career for which we're all uh, very thankful, really. So it's been a true honor to work with and know you. Thank you, Craig. Thank you. Yeah. I He's, uh, he's, uh, spreading, he is spreading uh, science, peace, and passion. The Marsili is spreading science, peace, and passion. That's, that's very true. Uh, yeah, uh, one question. You, you just mentioned that you, your friends at the time mentioned that, that you were crazy about writing a book because you would be better, you, you do better publishing papers. Papers matter more. This is a very, very important point today because uh, today books, printed books are very expensive and uh, professors are not interested in, in publishing books anymore. You, you don't see many textbooks being produced. 
you showed one, but we don't have as many. We have some older books and now our idea with the groundwater project is to spread knowledge. One question is, if people say, don't, do, don't write it because it, you know, it's not good for you. You could write a paper, it's more important. And another thing is that we know that books don't make you rich, right? So if, if it's not good for a, a, a scientific career and you don't make money, right? Why write a book? Yes, <laughs> it, it, it's, a, it's a good question. But um, my goal in life was not to make money. That was not my point. And my goal in life was perhaps has been said by Maria, by Hayat and by Craig, is to try to help students and to help colleagues. And uh, to give you an example, today, unfortunately in my view, most professors in class use PowerPoints and they, they have projectors and they show graphs and so on. I would never do that. I mean, um, I've been trained to teach with a piece of chalk and a blackboard. And I think you transmit much more information to your students by writing on the blackboard than showing them a beautiful, well arranged with nice colors or PowerPoint image. So uh, it's, it's, it's probably more time consuming to write by hand on the blackboard, but it's more efficient. And uh, what I like is to have efficient methods to teach. And I don't think that the PowerPoint, which is nice to do and it can be reused in the next course next year, I don't think that's a good idea. And maybe economically it would make sense, but you know, to teach, I don't think it's a good idea. So I've, I've, we've heard from students I've heard from students, Everton, that the students absolutely love Gillan's lectures on the blackboard. Um, and when you were in Adelaide a few years ago, Gillan, you gave a lecture. Um, it was on a whiteboard because the blackboards have gone, but um, and the students were just just loved it. Um, yeah. Thank you, Quinn. Well, but it's a you know I I, I agree with you. But uh, using a blackboard well, it's a talent. Not everyone can do it. <laughs> you, you, you do it naturally, but you don't think that that comes naturally to anyone. That doesn't happen that easily, no. That's why people, it's much easier using PowerPoint because you can play around, you can bring in nice uh, stuff, but preparing a nice blackboard, it's not easy. You know, it reminds me first experience. Uh, the first year I started teaching that course, I was writing on the blackboard. And at the end of the class, a student of the, of the class came to me and said, Sir, writing on the blackboard is fine, but you have, you have to have the well-organized blackboard with things that follow each other and so on. And it's neat. And you are messy. What you're writing on the blackboard is completely messy and I don't follow you. So I ha you have to teach and learn how to do a proper work, proper job with, with teaching on the blackboard. But I, I'm afraid that any class today doesn't have a blackboard anymore, even a whiteboard. They don't have anything, just have PowerPoints, which mm. I'm not, familiar, not happy with. Well, I think that the, I think there are black or whiteboards. I'm, there. What do you think, guys? Um, I may say something. Uh, actually, the blackboards are going away. The whiteboards are again. Now you have some mixed te uh, technique between a uh, presentation, PowerPoint, and, and presenting it to the wall and something like this. However, we must say, I mean, since last year, March, I do all my lectures on this same place here, looking into a black uh, 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 screen uh, due to Corona. And well, I would love to do my paintings again, but uh, in Corona times, we are happy that PowerPoint exists. Sorry. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. It's a good point. It's a good PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, but uh, you, you mentioned one thing. Uh, you, you, you want to say something, Craig? Please go ahead. No, no, no. All good, Everton. So the, the 
one point, Gila, is you, when you write a book, and I, I, I study on your books, you, and Hyatt mentioned, and Craig mentioned that, the, you know, your thinking is properly uh, organized for, for, for a reader. It's good to learn because it's organized. And when you go and prepare a, a presentation yourself that is not organized, you have to have a, 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 all organized in your head. And, and, and as you go on the blackboard, uh, if you have it, for you, it's just, like I mentioned, it's a talent, it's easy, but it's not for anyone. And you go there. I remember, I, I just like you, I go to, to, to my students and I say, well, you have to learn how to use the, the, the blackboard or the board because sometimes you go to a meeting it doesn't have to be a, a, a classroom. You, you, you're going to present something and you have to write something there. And you have to organize your, your, your thought before you talk, right? So what, what is your experience? Because after today is easy saying that because you, 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 you went through these classes so many times. So it's all well organized. But I know you, you, you published a book on, on food production. How would you teach something new using the blackboard? That's the point. <laughs> I, I don't know if I can answer that question. It, it's a good question. I, I think in fact that you, you had a, the right word. Uh, you need to have something organized in your mind before, before you can start teaching and putting words on a blackboard, on a white sheet, it doesn't matter. So you have to get organized on your the order in which you want to present your stuff and the links between the various stages. And if this is significantly coherent and uh, easy to understand, and I think you've done uh, at least half of the work of preparing the course. Organizing is the important matter, yes. And then you have also the help of the students who interrupt you or to ask, they ask you question at the end of the course and they say, uh, I didn't understand that. Can you explain again? Why did you say that? This is wrong and so on and so forth. And it reminds me of a lovely Russian student which came to me from Vladivostok to learn hydrogeology in, in Paris and she came to the class and she was absolutely shocked by the fact that the students were interrupting me during the class and they said you should not never interrupt the professor when he lectures and this is something that for the Russian culture was unacceptable and on the contrary I like that I like to be interrupted and to have the students comment on ask questions not, not that they prevent you to, to speak, but at least to clarify questions and so on. And I think you have a lot of improvement of your teaching if you have good students who, or, or poor, so it doesn't need to be good students, even poor students can ask very nice question and very important question. So I think the interaction with the students is something important in the class. I totally agree with you, totally. Which is not happening today with the pandemic, working on, on computers, you don't see the students, right? And then they rarely ask questions. That's yes problem. and no, because we, 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 we are miles and thousands of miles away from each other, not just for the coronavirus, but partly for that. And we, we managed to interact and we managed to have an exchange and so on. So I think we have to learn how to exchange ideas and to communicate with these new tools like Zoom and uh, uh, any of those those softwares which help propagate ideas. I think it's something we have to develop and uh, learn how to use. Yes, that's true, that's true. Well, guys, uh, the conversation is so good, but we have a limited time to, 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 to talk here. I would like to... to Yes, you, you, you're the boss here, you, you can say <laughs> No, <laughs> if you're going to conclude, I'd like first to thank all the participants, Hayet, Maria, and Craig, and the staff from the Groundwater Project who helped organize this meeting, 
and thank you for all what you've prepared, all what you've said, all the examples you gave. And I'm afraid we talked too much about me, but I think the, the those colleagues and friends did a very good job and I thank them very much. No, that's okay, that's okay. I, I, I'll give some time for, for your final statement, just a moment. I, I'd like to, 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 to ask you guys and, and ask you one final question. It's, we're, we're working on the groundwater project and our idea, as I mentioned at the very beginning, is to spread knowledge. One of the things is that we are now speaking in English and language, it's a tough you know, barrier for students. We want to do the books that we are preparing. First, we are preparing books in English, but we want them to be translated. Translated into French as well, not only into uh, you know, Portuguese, any language. People say that you know, all people that speak French can read English. And we know that this is not true. This is not true for any language, not for French, for any language, right? So we would like to, to have people helping translating books. So I would like you to say something for us about the, the importance of distributing knowledge for free and the importance of distributing knowledge in your life as an example for other people who are producing books to the groundwater project, please. No, that's a good point. I think uh, you need written material to really learn because you can follow a lecture, but then you have to go back and read something and confirm what you have heard and put that into words. Now, the problem of the, of the difference in languages, French, English, or Portuguese, or whatever, or Spanish, I think it's going in a few years to fade away because automatic translation is becoming increasingly correct and increasingly good. And uh, I have viewed the software, it's not, it's not the Google Translate, which is not very good, but uh, I forgot the name of that software. Uh, uh, DeepL, I think, Gilan. DeepL? DeepL. DeepL, yes, DeepL. It, it, there may be others, but DeepL is really very good. And of course, you, you, you cannot always rely on it. You have to read and check that every page doesn't contain a mistake. But it's so good and so true to the, to the meaning that really it's impressed me. And I think in maybe 10, 20 years, speaking in, in French and being automatically translated into English, you know, as you talk is going to be possible and books will be translated at no cost and a very little cost and a very high speed. So I think you're absolutely right that it should be put this written material in common but I think it's better to translate than to hope that students or colleagues will learn French, English, German, Portuguese, Spanish, and whatnot, and Chinese, and any of these Asian languages that we, we need to, to, be, to be aware of. But I think it's, that's a problem that will be solved. Well, I agree, so just let me add something. My, uh, it's my understanding just like you, that this, the, the software will, will improve fast. But translating science, it's a bit harder because of the jargon. So if we have more people translating our books, that could be used for artificial intelligence, la intelligence later to help improving the, the translations to our, to our field of, of knowledge. That's, that's a, a, an improvement that we could add by using the groundwater project translations into different languages. That's our, our aim. Okay. Yeah, I agree, I agree. I mean, the, the, these new softwares that translate so well, they, they are based in studying text in English and text in French and text in other languages and to compare them and to determine how do you translate this expression and not words by words, the expression and the meaning. So I think Artificial intelligence is really beautiful, a beautiful tool to, to help translate, including all the details and the, the theory behind it. So I, th I have good hopes that this will be easily available in a, in a few years. Well, I hope so. I hope so. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to help, but I'm not sure how long it's going to take, but it, it's going fast. So, guys, could you please add something about that? And... Um, 
before well, I think our time is, is up now. Could you please make your final statement and we leave uh, Guilherme for the, the, the last word, please? Uh, I think about uh, writing books, uh, uh, introducing uh, geological properties, uh, petrophysical properties, heterogeneity in uh, general was uh, 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 nicely represented and uh, uh, in journals, in books, uh, in uh, petroleum uh, modeling. But in uh, hydrogeological and aquifer modeling, it's not, uh, there's not too much text uh, writing uh, uh, adapting or uh, 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 transforming uh, geological properties in uh, mathematical equations. I think that we have to uh, write uh, papers and uh, books on that. Uh, concerning uh, how to teach using uh, a blackboard or uh, PowerPoint or uh, uh, paper for il illustrations, I think that we have to uh, use all of them. Uh, for example, PowerPoint was uh, uh, an aid uh, for us to uh, continue uh, studying and teaching, etc. But uh, it's not the same, uh, uh, the same happiness when uh, you are transmitting the, 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 the message. It is like, uh, uh, playing football with the PlayStation or on uh, ground. I think it's not the, the same thing. Uh, concerning the blackboard, I think that we have to uh, subdivide it uh, into uh, parts. One part to present the lesson as we, uh, as we uh, have organized it uh, in our mind, uh, in a logical uh, uh, thinking. And uh, a part for uh, the question coming from uh, students and to think together on uh, the question uh, that comes from them to encourage them discussing to uh, to be, because uh, even you you will reorganize your you will, uh, uh, it helps us to reorganize our lesson uh, for the next uh, uh, time. I would like uh, to to thank uh, Professor De Marcilli, uh, Craig, and uh, Maria for uh, uh, this uh, nice discussion. Uh, and I would like uh, also to thank you, Everton, uh, and uh, all the Groundwater Project team for organizing this uh, uh, international event. Uh, thank you for inviting us, and uh, let's continue uh, doing uh, conversations and uh, uh, writing books and papers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You won't get rid of me of me that easily. I'll, I'll be after you soon. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for your help. You helped us very much. Please, Maria. I think I make it short. What we need, whether in quantitative hydrogeology, in ge geology, engineering, or philosophy, we always need teachers who are inspiring and who uh, are able to, to uh, explain complicated things easily. And in this, Guilain, you are for me really the master and I always try to do it like you, of course I don't, <laughs> but I try and this is, and I th really thank you for being as you are and uh, that I was able to learn from you and with you. Yeah, that's my famous last words uh, here. Uh, and of course, I want to thank everybody, you, Everton, and Hayat, and Craig. It's so good to meet you again. And of course, to see you again in good shape, Guilain, is also a pleasure for me. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank, you, you. thank you to the team. Thank you very much. Very kind. Very kind. Craig, Craig, you, please. Look, I think it's um, impossible to predict uh, the future. Uh, with any great level of precision, but I think we know one thing for sure about groundwater and, and that is that the number of problems that we're grappling with now already significant, as I mentioned, from water supply and security, scarcity, coal seam gas, fracking, food production, energy, there's a huge number of those issues, but climate change, population growth will only exacerbate pressure on all of our natural resources, including water resources and groundwater resources. So groundwater is here to stay, if not to grow in its significance and, in, and its importance. And I think um, science and research is one part of that, but I think management and policy and governance is also crucial in getting all of these interacting um, 
you know, well is crucial and education and capacity building and, uh, and all of those things. So training, teaching and textbooks are, are a huge part of, of the issue there. Getting research out into the public domain um, so people use it uh, needs education and training. Um, so textbooks, books, uh, the Groundwater Project are playing a crucial role and clearly translation and accessibility um, are a huge part of, of that. So I think all of these initiatives are important. And again, as everyone here today has said, it's been a great discussion, um, an honor to be involved in today. Thank you for the invitation um, and to know and work with you, Gilan. So um, look forward to many more years. Thank you very much. Gilan, your final statement, please. I know you, it's your second final statement, please. <laughs> <laughs> what I'd like to say is that I didn't know anything about carnival hydrology when I started learning at school. And slowly I developed the understanding of hydrology in the underground. And I think the reward I had to study this, this topic is, is at least two, two times. First, I met a large number of good colleagues of people who in, in, were interested in the same topic and we became friends. So it's, it's an area where people work together, exchange ideas, and they don't hide what they found in the cupboard. So it's an area where there's a lot of exchange between the, the researchers and the professors and the students. So it's a very lively atmosphere to study a topic which is difficult mm -hmm. because groundwater hydrology and quantitative hydrogeology is not easy. It has a lot of peculiarities and uh, uncertainties and uh, equations and whatnot. So it's a very, at least, scientifically deep problem to work on. And the last point I want to make is that it's also an area where there are very significant human problems or society's, society's problem, water resource, water pollution, energy, storage, whatnot. So there are many instances where hydrogeologists trained in quantitative hydrogeology are needed to help society. So it's an area where you can think that you can help solving problems, applied problems, real problems from the, from the world in different countries and uh, help here from what you've learned there. Uh, it's something where you exchange. So it's, it's a very fascinating job and I recommend students who have not yet selected what side or area of geology they want to, to to learn or to work on, to consider hydrogeology as one of the most fascinating facets of geology. Thank you very much. Very good words. Thank you, everyone. That was a very, very entertaining and very instructive uh, session for me. And I hope for all the audience here, it was a pleasure and an honor having you with us, Gillan. And I hope we we'll see you soon. Uh, you, you participated on the Groundwater Project and we'll get together and we hope we can help us spread the knowledge of groundwater better than you do, which is hard because you're doing quite well, right? So we're looking forward to, to have your help for us, okay? Thank you guys, thank you very much. It was very nice having you together with us, bye. Goodbye. Okay. Of our our talk with Guillaume de Marseille. We have to excuse you, excuse all of you, because Guillaume cannot make it for the, the question and answer session. But we have the kind participation of Maria and, and Craig. They're here to help us and to offer us a little bit of our, uh, of our knowledge and understanding of Guillaume's work. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Craig. And Hi everyone, thank you. Go from there. I'll, I'll, I'll have a, a few questions here. Let me do this. There's a question here to all of you. 
Uh, and since you you know his book, it's better asking for you. Books bring the fingerprint of their authors on them. What do you believe are Gillan fingerprint, fingerprints on his book? Was it his style, <laughs> his thinking? What was it? Mm -hmm. Mar it? Maria, Maria, do you want to have a, have a first crack at that? <laughs> I'm not sure whether I understood the question correctly, but the fingerprints of Gillan, I think it was really uh, uh, to put geostatistics into the context of hydrogeology. Uh, Guillaume de Marcelli was already a, a brave geostatistician, but then he put this knowledge into hydrogeology and, and this is something which still holds. I'm not sure whether I understood the question correctly, but the fingerprints of Guillaume, I think. I, I, can, I, can, I can rephrase the question. The question is. When you when you uh, when you see an author, someone has a sound. Huh? I, I can I can I can. Hey, hi. Could you please? Could you please uh, turn off your presentation because you're listening to it there from there? Okay. Okay. I muted her. Okay. Now, now it's sorry for being <laughs> impolite. Um, can you answer that, Craig? Please. Uh, yeah, look, I, I, I think that um, obviously Gilan's background was in geologic engineering and he always had um, a big interest in the geology, but also the engineering and the mathematics. So he's always had an interest in, 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 in the, the field side of things, but especially, and he said it in his talk about, you know, um, you know, his professor not uh, thinking he'd get into hydrogeology because of not going into the field and so forth, but he loved it. And so he always had an interest in the mathematical and quantitative and, and, and the modelling and so forth, but not exclusively. And, um, and so the genesis of the book was out of teaching for the most part, because I know that he was putting lectures together, you know, often at the very last night um, before giving the lectures. And then he had a whole course and thought, Thought, gee, this could be uh, an interesting um, thing to put together as a book. So I think, in a way, this also reflects Gillan's passion and interest and dedication to teaching. Um, and the teaching, in a sense, was the the motivation and the genesis of the book. Um, and now all of that was in the French edition and then translated by Guillaume's wife, Gunilla, into, into English and so forth. So, uh, but I think it's that quantitative interest, um, but also an, a de desire to teach. Guillaume loves teaching and um, getting information out there and working with people. And I think his book's been a, a, a terrific mechanism and medium for achieving many of his own personal goals and, and motivations. Well, but, but I think that the point of the question, I think that, that was missing there uh, in, in the answer is, like you, Craig, you're writing a book right now for the Groundwater Project, right? Yeah. You're authoring a book. Mm -hmm. And I mean, uh, when you write a book, your writing style shows something about yourself, right? <laughs> or mm -hmm. usually uh, yeah. we try to hide when we write technical stuff. But authors always leave, leave a fingerprint on yeah. it. You, you, can, you can tell a little bit about the author when you're mm -hmm. reading something. And so that was the point. When you're writing yeah. science, when you're writing an article, it's very simple because it's too dry, you know, you just go for the very specific of the, 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 the science and no space for explanation and discussion. Mm -hmm. So what would you think is, the, the, is his fingerprints on his book? Because you've read right. it. I think um, attention to detail and um, also being um, a perfectionist as well. So no stones uh, are left unturned, but also a, a happiness with equations. And, and, and not all textbooks um, are quantitative 
and in hydrogeology, not all textbooks are quantitative. And I think this was a very deliberate part of Gillan's way of thinking, etc., uh, as well. So there are various fingerprints that come through, uh, for me, the, the, the attention to detail, the perfectionism, the comprehensiveness, that the happiness level with mathematics and the emphatic desire to have quantitative dimensions in that book was hugely driven by Gillan's own personal inspiration and drive. And um, But also there's an entire chapter in the book uh, on geostatistics, which I think was pretty novel for the early 1980s in a textbook. And that came out of Gillan's interest working with Georges Matheron and Jean-Pierre Delhomme and others um, on, on that. And that's a, a huge fingerprint of Gillan's own personal um, interest and work. You want to say something, Maria? Uh. When we were talking, I was just looking into the book again. <laughs> <laughs> and there's one thing I think which is yeah. really characteristic for him. Uh, mm -hmm. The very simple black and white sketches. <laughs> Nowadays we are familiar with the colored and even animated pictures. Uh, and, every, and he has very distinct, very simple black and white pictures which mm. make things extremely clear there is yeah. nothing around it no decoration it's just the fact he's trying to show and to illustrate and this is something we can still use today in black and white <laughs> and I, I, it's a great it's a great point maria and if you've ever seen gilan give a lecture um and a, a number of us have seen gilan teaching and giving lectures and and they're amazing because he has this remarkable ability to get on a blackboard with a piece of chalk or a whiteboard now with a texter and draw a picture um, that boils it down to the most salient fundamental features. And it reflects just the incredible intellect of, of, of the man, um, really. He can see right through to the the most crucial parts of what need to be explained. Um, and I think that's why he's an outstanding teacher. And I know that his students, um, all of those that I've spoken to have said that as well. And it reflects, as Maria says, in the textbook. If I may add something, there's just one picture in the book, which is not a black and white sketch, but it's a photograph which he take in North Africa. Uh, or he did not take this photograph, but it's about a well digger. And I always show this picture in my lectures in my very first lectures on hydrogeology, I show this picture because it, it also shows his big respect for our subject, for groundwater, for water. So it, it, it illustrates what human beings do to get water, digging 80 meters deep wells by hands and not being sure whether they survive this digging. Mm -hmm. So this picture I love and it, it's the first picture I show to my students from this book. So sorry, I had to add this. <laughs> I have, I have a, a, an idea. When we talk to, to Gilan, he's, he has this, you know, he, he's such a kind person. You know, that's himself. And uh, the way he, 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 you know, he tackles the, the subject uh, reflects that kindness because even, you know, the tough subject, you know, you go there and it looks smooth, right? <laughs> when you read in the book. And, and I think this is, uh, that relates to the author quite clearly because when you, because for me, I first studied and then I met Guillaume, right? Probably same with you guys. And that, and that is exactly what we see. Hi, you were, you were uh, Gillan's uh, student, right? PhD student. What do you think about the relationship between his writing and his personality? That's what we're talking about here. You have to unmute yourself, please. You have to unmute yourself. Your phone is muted, please. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, 
I think uh, there is a link between his personality, uh, his way of teaching, and his way of writing. Uh, he writes in a simple way, and he's treating people and, uh, and uh, students in a simple way, innocent way, generous way. That's right. it. No, that's true. That's true. Well, th there's a question here from, uh, uh, let me see. Uh, Luis Hernandez, I think that, that, that goes to, to, to Maria, I think. Doesn't your statistic limit our understanding about how groundwater system works? I don't think that geostatistics limits it. I think it, geostatistics enhanced our knowledge. As I told you earlier, uh, I, I was sitting in a conference this day, um, mm -hmm. uh, which is on, on, on uh, nuclear waste disposal sites. And every minute I was listening to all those talks, I found out that uh, describing heterogeneity of the subsurface, that is exactly the question, we, we can calculate so many things, we can build models, we can have ideas, but we never will be able really to, to, to uh, uh, describe the heterogeneity. And the first step to do this was geostatistics. And, and so, no, geostatistics does not limit, but enhance, as I understand, uh, our understanding of fluid flow in the subsurface. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Hyatt, <clears throat> I have a question um, for you, Hyatt. <laughs> I think that... Uh, I know you're, you're afraid of my, my questions, but I'm going, I'm going to no, do it anyway. <laughs> not at all. You are very kind. Uh, uh, no, I don't think that... Uh, I don't think that uh, geostatistics limit uh, uh, our knowledge about uh, or our uh, calculation uh, when treating with uh, geological modeling. Uh, in my experience, for example, uh, the, the, the only way to integrate multi-source data is by using geostatistics. Uh, in uh, aquifer uh, modeling, we, have, uh, we don't have ma ma much data, so we have to extend data. How to extend data from outcrops, from end of boreholes, from uh, geological knowledge, and how to transform it into uh, digital uh, uh, data is by geostatistics, I think. Uh, and as, I, as says uh, Maria, um, the ambiguity when, uh, to, to, to understand uh, the process controlling the, the dynamics of water and the pathway of uh, water is to understand the heterogeneity and the lateral facies variation. So we have to use uh, stochastic modeling and uh, uh, stochastic simulation of uh, facies to, uh, mm -hmm. to understand uh, the conceptual model of, uh, of the, the aquifers. Yes, true. I'd like to thank some people here. Nestor from Venezuela, Khalil, Khalil uh, Al Samurai from Libya, uh, Obuwan uh, from Uganda for being such frequent flyers with us. Thank you very much. We enjoy your presence with us here. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, Luis, uh, no, Alfonso Rivera mentioned that he was one of the luckiest students from around the world to be accepted and to be mentored by Professor De Marcy Yi. I have here Dick Jackins, Dick Jackins, ah, Jesus. When you speak French, then it changes the, you know, the way we speak, it gets better. Dick Jackins, Jackson says, Chair Guillain, il y a longtemps que nous nous avons rencontré à discuter les grandes choses de la vie. Allô, Agunia. J'espère que Remove est encore chez vous. Dick. <laughs> That's for, for Guillain directly. Alessandro Cesarino from Brazil, he asks, is there uh, an intention to translate the quantitative hydrogeology as groundwater was, like free to all? Um, I might try that. I don't think so. Not for now, because the, the, 
the the rights i think are still with the the publisher right so the groundwater from freeze and cherry there was a long way to get the the rights back to the author so they would allow to translate and to distribute that for free we had the same i'm, I'm answering that based on the answer that we that we've got from uh emilio custodio uh and and llamas their book also belongs in the rights belongs to the, the publishers and they don't have the rights to to distribute so translations are still not free to anyone could you add something to that then what, what do you think guys Is, am i right Mm -hmm. That's consistent, fully consistent with my understanding, Everton, that the, the rights are still with the publisher, um, as, with several, as with many other books. Uh, and so um, your answer's spot on. Very good. I have a question for you, Hayat. How was being his student when you were there? Uh, uh, you know, you told me a nice story because you were, you know, you were pregnant when you were doing your PhD. That's hard work. Jesus Christ. Mm. <laughs> I could hardly finish my PhD. This I is a personal history, I think. <laughs> 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 but I don't know how to, uh, to, uh, to tell it in, uh, in English because um, maybe you will translate for me. Well, I can try. Um, euh, ben, la, la dernière année de, de ma thèse, j'étais en train de rédiger et, euh, et euh, je me rends compte que je suis enceinte. Et ben, j'étais à l'IFP, euh, c'est-à-dire que je travaillais à l'IFP et Guylain de Marcilly a été euh, mon professeur à l'université Pierre et Marie Curie. Donc, j'essaie. Comment, s'il vous plaît <rire> Ah, d'accord. Mm -hmm. <rire> I'm not a good translator. Don't go to class, please. <laughs> <laughs> so she was telling that the, 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 the last year of her PhD, she was working at the, at the lab with the Marseille and she was, uh, she was pregnant. It was five months pregnant, something like that. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I, um, uh, uh, donc j'ai essayé uh, à tout coup de ne pas rencontrer de Marseille parce que je ne sais pas, pour moi, c'est le père. Donc, j'ai été en train de, de, de porter des chemises qui sont un peu euh, va... <rire> vastes pour ne pas… C'est-à-dire que je voulais continuer à rédiger ma thèse et à faire ma thèse sans, sans que les gens se rendent compte que je suis enceinte et pour ne pas provoquer en eux une certaine pitié. Je n'ai pas aimé ça, voilà. Et je voulais déposer ma thèse et après leur dire. Et donc… Et donc Uh, mon non, 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 si vous... <laughs> no, she says she was, she was a bit, you know, a bit shy about that. She was concerned about what would be uh, Guilain's reaction uh, of knowing that she was, you know, pregnant at the end of her PhD. She, she wanted to, 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 to hand her, you know, her thesis before uh, people know in that situation she was using, you know, a bit lose clothes not to you know to try to disguise the situation <laughs> and please go ahead uh, so uh, i will be finishing uh, two seconds uh, uh, donc uh, le, le deuxième directeur de ma thèse qui est christian ravel peut-être le lui avait dit il a dit que Ayet, elle est un peu fatiguée elle est enceinte et donc uh, euh, sans rencontrer de Marcelli, sans discuter, sans discuter avec lui. Il, il ne m'a pas posé de questions, il est allé au CNRS, il a doublé ma, ma bourse. Voilà. Et euh, 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 je, je me suis rendu compte en allant à la, à la banque et j'ai vu que j'avais <rire> plein d'argent. J'ai été contente, bien sûr. Mais d'où vient cet argent Et après, j'ai connu que c'est euh, Marcelli qui a doublé ma bourse. Comment, comment est-ce voilà. euh, 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 le nombre de professeurs, de l'autre professeur Je euh, Christian Raven de l'IFP. Ah, Christian Raven. So she says that, that, that uh, although she hasn't told him, uh, the other professor, she had another co-supervisor, he, he mentioned to, to, to Guilain that she was a bit, you know, a bit tired 
because she was pregnant already. And without telling her, she uh, he just doubled her scholarship. And she, she just knew that at the moment when she went to, you know, to get the money and she saw that was way more money than she was expecting. And that was kind kindness from him. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <Yes. laughs> It's uh, quite a nice story. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, that tells a, a, a lot about about Gian. It's very nice, and that was, you know, you she she was high and was at the same time taking PhD at the same time. And when I was in Waterloo, you were in Paris, Paris, right? Yeah. Good, guys. I know we're talking and uh, we're having fun here, but our time is short, and we have to finish. I'd like you to put a good word to, about the, the Marseille and to people that, is, that are watching us here so we can uh, wrap up our presentation today. I'd like to thank you for participating. Please, who's first? Okay, Maria, you. <laughs> What can we say? I, I know, because, because you said, it, because it's late in Germany. Yeah. It's very, oh, in it's very late. Uh, I, what I want to say about Guillain de Massilly, I think he's one of the best friends and colleagues and teacher, of course, but first place friends I ever had and I still have, hopefully. And he's so generous and we had so good time together. And, uh, well, I'm really glad that I once met him and that I have the honor to be one of his friends. Thank you very much. Very kind. You, Craig? Um, yeah, look, I fully agree with Maria. Uh, as a scientist and an engineer, Gilan has made so many pioneering contributions uh, and seminal contributions to hydrogeology. And, and there are so many of them um, from... Um, fundamental research contributions in things like geostatistics and, uh, and and many other areas, but also in really understanding applied issues as well, whether it's food and water and energy, uh, working with African colleagues and really coming back to the issue of the textbook. Um, Gilan's passionate about working with people in other countries, Africa and elsewhere. It just speaks so much to him and the way he thinks and how he feels about the world um, and, and teaching. Um, there's just so many ways he's contributed and given so much to us in hydrogeology. Uh, at a personal level, um, like Maria, I, I feel tremendously privileged to have had the opportunity and the good fortune of meeting Gilan and knowing him uh, now for, for a while. And, and it has been literally life-changing. He has been an advisor Uh, a mentor, always happy to answer questions, to tell you if you're doing things that are, are good, to tell you when you're not doing things that are that are right or how they might be done better. And the advice is always incredibly smart and incisive and caring. It comes from a really genuine place in Gilan's heart. And he is a very kind, generous and very selfless person who has given so much of his time and his life to hydrogeology, to research and, and to students and so forth. Um, and so I also, like Maria, feel that it's a real privilege to have Gilan as a friend. Um, it's been amazing. Thank you very much, Craig. Nice words. You, Hayat. Uh, what can I say? Um, uh, it's I'm still impressed by Guillain de Marcilly. Uh, his way is to, to work on uh, uh, too many subjects, to, with uh, <laughs> too many people, with uh, everywhere uh, in uh, all over the world. Mm. And I'm impressed uh, uh, of his uh, moving from uh, hydraulics to geology, to hydrogeology, to geostatistics, and to uh, <laughs> uh, food security, and to uh, Uh, he's impressing also when when simplifying uh, problems uh, and uh, what can I say uh, simplifying the problems uh, uh, even when uh, when um, uh, when giving lessons uh, uh, when uh, uh, when resolving uh, uh, pupil and uh, pupil and uh, students uh, uh, problems 
also. Uh, the other thing uh, which is impressing me, he, he's, he, he, he conti he's continuing uh, uh, working until now at his age. And uh, when I'm tired, I say to myself, look at the mercy, he's continuing yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, combating. Yeah. Uh, uh, one day I I say I sent him the email. Uh, I had I am tired, and the next day I had. Uh, what do you think to <laughs> to work together together on that uh, subject? So uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, I, uh, at his age now, um, I think that uh, he's uh, also uh, how to say in uh, in English. Uh, he's impressing. He's uh... mm. very impressive. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much for your kind words and for helping us here. Actually, in our in our work here, we brought uh, Guillaume de Marcilly as we brought as we brought famous authors, and we have not uh, uh, not unfamous people like you guys, you're very, very famous as well in our field of expertise, to help us show our audience that doing hydrogeology, doing good for the world is also fun. We have good people around, we have friends working, we're not talking about science all the time, talking about Corona beer like Maria mentioned. <laughs> yes, uh, so we, we can do well and have fun. And you see, I have uh, Guillaume as a good example, as John Cherry is also doing, Emilio, they're all working hard. Um, my former supervisor, Jim Barker, always said, when you do what you like, it's not work, right? So we like what you're doing and we're having fun. So why, why, why not doing it, right? Yeah. That's yeah. what I do. They have mm -hmm. fun. They have they like being with people, with students around and thinking about things. Their life is an example for us. And that's what we're trying to bring here to everybody. Because, you know, working and studying can be fun, right? Thank you very much, guys, for your great help. I loved having you around here. And we'll see each other again very soon. Okay, guys? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.